Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all having a great day so far. Um, I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me to share my research here today. Um, and um, I'd like you all to know that it's in a, the preliminary stages and um, any feedback at the end would be appreciated as well. Um, I'd like to uh, begin today by giving you a brief introduction about the premise of the study and my research question. So we stand today at the crossroads of a process of self-digitization. And although the binaries of the real as well as the virtual selves uh, remain physically divorced from one another, we do find ourselves still deeply in embedded and intricately enmeshed within these realities of cyberspace. And our move towards the complex um, cyber interactions demands um, urgent attention and discussions on the affordances as well as the constraints of digital technology and their role in the construction of digital democracies. And we know that a lot of scholars are currently attempting to answer those questions as well. Um, so what I'm here for and what I'm really interested in is looking at or examining the, the digital spaces as well as trying to excavate the voice of the subaltern, um, but to do so uh, with respect to the cyber south, as I call it, the southern hemisphere. Um, and I'd like to do it using or applying digital movements in that sense. Um, and I speak here of the South because I understand that there are challenges that are um, multi-layered, actually, um, and more difficult uh, with respect to that of the North. And so these are important uh, things to address. Uh, I speak specifically of three um, layers of complications, uh, as I call it, that deny this excavation of the voice of the subaltern in the South. And before I do, I'd like to introduce to you the particular premise of my study. So um, my research primarily focuses on the online queer activist movement um, in India, which is the decriminalization of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. Uh, this uh, was the recently eliminated colonial law, um, and this forbade um, and punished homosexuality um, as part of uh, unnatural sex in the in the continent in the in the country, um, and. What uh, the movement uh, posits um, at its core um, is the struggle of the queer subaltern, um, and I take here the deliberate liberty of addressing um, or denoting the term subaltern to the Indian queer, um, against heterosexual, masculine, and patriarchal authority of national institutions. And what I'm really interested in looking at is the public and private discourses surrounding this issue on social media. And for this particular paper, I'll only be looking at the Twitter um, as representative of the Cyber South. Um, and I employ Twitter APIs to collect tweets um, that I use. Um, I use hashtags here as queries to filter out um, the, the tweets. And some of the hashtags here are very specific to the movement, as you can see, for example, um, hashtags 377 quit India, article 377, uh, and some of them are a little generic, but also play a very important part um, in the movement online. So moving on to uh, an important theoretical work um, in the subaltern, of course, uh, Spivak's um, Can the Subaltern Speak argues that the subaltern, in fact, can speak, but is not often heard. And her work um, talks about the, the deep hierarchical structures that exist in the political sphere where the voices of the marginalized often do not find a space to be heard. So what can we say about the virtual representation of the subaltern? What can we say about their presence and participation online, um, be it voluntary or involuntary? And does the movement here in this case enable the queer population um, with tools to bring to the fore their own challenges and struggles of being queer? Um, in essence, are they able to self-identify and self-represent uh, the movement? Or are we merely depicting an intent or an ideal of exclusion, queer empathy and support? Um, and we're here are we talking about a group of people um, that define or speak on behalf of this collectivity? And if so, is that enough? So with um, the first argument of the problematics of representation and reliability of digital uh, spaces in the South, I enter ironically into a discussion of the first layer with a critique of my own methodology. So a deeper understanding of any social media research is not possible without this caveat. Um, so according to Zainab Tufekshi, 
the primary objective for any social media research um, on Twitter is owing to its ease of access to large-scale databases of human activity in, the, in social media. And therefore, we need to pay special attention to the validity, the reliability, the representativeness, as well as the inclusivity of social media big data, owing to a lot of different factors um, that play a big part of the big data vagueness or algorithmic invisibility online. Um, and we need a separate discussion about these uh, factors as well. Um, in essence, this is to say that this engenders both the Twitter sphere as well as my own research. Um, a little exclusive, um, also given that very few tweets in any given data set would be in any language other than English. So it represents a particular type of population. Um, and of course, it is in no way uh, representative of the population or of the movement as such. Um, where the first layer of complication speaks uh, about the lack of access to uh, research uh, databases for scholars. The second layer actually talks about the lack of access uh, for technology to the Indian population. So Twitter registers a mere 30 uh, million monthly active users. That forms a very small percentage of users from India. So the question of what access and visibility mean in cyber networks of the South are vital for questions um, and future debates on presence and inclusion. Um, as Radhika Gajala states, in the case of the third, third world subaltern other, there are uh, many more steps involved with respect to access and gatekeeping, both culturally as well as uh, technologically, and there are only specific types of hierarchies of literatures uh, and literacies that are engaged. So as a, part, a large part of the so-called subaltern are involuntarily excluded without internet access. And so this engenders these cyberspaces naturally exclusive with only a few privileged people being able to access these spaces who represent themselves or represent others. Um, I argue therefore that this lack of access or in other words this digital divide is a serious concern um, and also limitations and constraints of digital media establish new gatekeeper roles that in turn limit the voice of intersectional diversity. This brings me to the third layer of complication, which is, um, is mere presence indicative of voluntary participation? Does it mark the existence of the subaltern voice? According to Lisa Nakamura, even if there is an actual visibility of marginalized groups online, it's not always something that results in fruitful engagement with the paradigms of discrimination. In that sense, it could mean that social inequality and discrimination on the cyber spheres are usually an extension of offline realities and their invisibility or their inability to self-identify in addition to this lack of access for SPIVAC is the denial of expression to, to their own knowledge. They remain bound by these um, offline hegemonic hierarchical and authoritarian structures that only, are, that only a few privileged are able to penetrate owing to their own Western knowledge. So, um, to talk about my own methodology, I have been able to collect more than 500 tweets over a period of one month during the peak of the queer movement in January 2018 when the Supreme Court of India was trying to deliberate or reconsider the decision of whether or not to decriminalize Section 377 um, and now in the months of February and March 2019. I have manually um, annotated and compartmentalized around 200 unique tweets um, and categorized them in graphs um, and this will give you a better idea of what um, the categorizations I was looking for. As you can see, the positive sentiment as well as queer empathy are um, overwhelmingly positive, which contributes to um, the virtual um, success of the movement. But you can see uh, that people um, who, who are talking about themselves and their own struggles of being queer, uh, the percentage is well below 15%, which is not a lot. Um, and the other tweets uh, that I've collected is how many people are actually posting on queer platforms as opposed to as individuals. Um, and of course, the percentage of tweets um, that are political, um, unrelated, or religious. So these are uh, just a few examples of what I would consider uh, positive tweets. Uh, of course, not by the community, but by people who are supporting um, or in support of the movement. Um, yeah, uh, members of the LGBT community are no different than anyone else. Love, respect, and affection have the same definition for all. Um, as you might notice here, that um, people who do support the movement uh, kind of distance themselves a little bit from talking about themselves. So they're always ardent supporters of the movement, um, but they are always um, linking the, uh, the queer to the other, which is why I talk about the, the queer uh, in terms of the subaltern. Um, and the next chart here, 
actually uh, talks about uh, the number of people who self-represent, and the reason I call it that is because of particular linguistic structures, um, or let's say, use of pronouns, um, like I, uh, and that they use to talk about their own experiences of being queer. And out of um, um, all of these, um, tweets that uh, are all positive sentiments for um, the queer movement, only around 15% of them are talking about themselves. Uh, for example, these are very few um, rare tweets that um, I could get my hands on that talk about uh, themselves and their struggles and challenges of being queer um, on a public platform because um, if I go to Facebook or WhatsApp, I would be able to find uh, private and closeted spaces or platforms where people are discussing their own experiences, but uh, since Twitter is a public platform, um, this, is, this remains a serious issue. Uh, going forward, um, this final chart speaks for how many people are actually talking about um, anything related to the movement on queer platforms or like pages that, um, act as like a big support uh, in terms of carrying the movement forward. Um, and this can include like uh, news pages or even celebrities, Twitter feeds, um, as opposed to individuals who are posting it, uh, uh, about the movement. And oftentimes anonymous tweets are uh, by individual queer uh, are even posted on uh, these platforms uh, as well. This is just to give you an example of the kind of platforms that I'm talking about. like. Uh, whether it's like feminism or youth bowl, and there are certain bots also that function for this particular purpose. Uh, so queer empathy and queer collectivities largely carry the burden of the queer cause, and this makes the identity of the cause defined by a diversity of individuals rather than a monolithic one. Uh, Nancy Fraser's notion of the public sphere as a subaltern counterpublic space cannot be disputed in this case, of course, because of the collection of individual tweets that carry the movement of the subaltern forward. Furthermore, as Gajala argues, we cannot simply reduce our articulations of the subaltern presence online into just the pre their presence and absence. We need to be able to talk about uh, their partial, structured, or fragmented presence um, and representation as well. Um, their marginalized voice, according to me, emerges differently in this case because it's constructed especially to combat masculinities and patriarchies and patriarchal ways of being. Therefore, it is the movement and not the individual here that reshapes these existing hierarchies. It is the movement that intends to be a space for queer representation, and it takes agency in the construction of a subaltern voice, even in the possible absence of the subaltern. I argue that activism comes in many forms, and in this case, it enables a veritable shift of the voice, thereby extending a space for subverting, dismantling, and rebuilding these power structures. Gajala argues here that the voices are not always individual. And produce and perform a complex nodal interface. I reiterate this argument, but I also believe that we need desperately to address and therefore produce what I term self activism. Hashtags must become, for the participant, a platform to perform their intersectional queerness voluntarily. There is need for self representation that will further bring these discussions on the challenges of intersectionality to, to the cyberspace, as representing oneself becomes an act of open rebellion, an act of performance. And we need individual as well as collective solutions to look at all of these complications uh, together. And um, as one possible uh, solution for this problem, we need to not merely look at um, how we can decolonize these spaces or practice um, diversity and intersectionality on these spaces, but we also need to rethink the definitions of representation um, and reconstruct the link that we, sh that we have between um, our realities, uh, cyber uh, realities as well as offline realities. Um, uh, I also think that it's possible that we, uh, moving into the big data age, we are confusing definitions of what collectivities and communities may mean uh, between uh, technology as well as uh, in sociology or um, in cultural, um, cultural studies. So there is a veritable need to restructure the meaning of presence online, particularly for the subaltern in the cyber south whose voice is heard but not really felt. And whether or not this cultural there is cultural victory that's associated with their voice is another debate altogether. Thank you.